Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeremy Hafner, Chancellor at the University of Denver, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you into yet another town hall meeting, a town hall meeting that is focused on our aspirations and actions around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a wonderful um, program planned for you with um, good time to ask questions and answers. Uh, the panelists, I think, are ready to um, dive into it, but I'm going to start a little bit with some opening remarks and then some rules of engagement for a very productive um, and safe environment for conversations. And then turn it over to our new provost, uh, Mary Clark, who will say a few words and then we'll get into the actual programming as well. So to begin with, uh, the reason for this town hall meeting was, as you may have seen on Friday, a message was sent out with a, a number of commitments and action items that we had been working on um, developing for really advancing our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Of course, we know that the inequities that we are experiencing are deep and impactful on our community. And of course, the protests resulting from the killing of so many individuals, especially Joy Floyd, is one that is with us and will be with us for years to come. And so our actions become all that more important. So I want to reiterate, though, that what we said on Friday was just the beginning of a dialogue, a dialogue that really start, is in full swing today, that the draft was exactly a draft and that what we want today is the beginning of a broader conversation of your thoughts, your input about what is important as we really work forward on the action items that we'll um, spend so much time with this next academic year. The team has been led by three individuals. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists right now. And so panelists, when I say your name, of course, uh, wave so the audience can see you all. Um, Interim Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Tom Romero. Tom uh, has just stepped into his role uh, within the last several months. Uh, and I'm so appreciative of the time that he's taken to jump in and, and work on this very important project. Interim Vice Chancellor for Campus Life and Inclusive Excellence, Nikki Latino. Nikki has also stepped forward in um, the last few months um, at a time when we really needed her leadership. And not but not least, <laughs> another interim, Interim Vice Chancellor for Human Relations and Inclusive Community, Jaron Lowe, Jaron Wavefoot. All three of them have um, been so instrumental and I am deeply, deeply appreciative of their leadership at a very challenging time, as we all know. And they have been working um, at my request to develop an action plan that we can really hit the ground running with. An action plan consisting of items that will really have an impact and change the environment um, for our minoritized peoples here at the University of Denver. You know, this is an important year for us because as the message indicated, we're now 20 years into our very concerted effort around diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we'll be celebrating 20 years of our diversity summit um, next uh, springtime. We've come a long way. We have made considerable progress, but make, make no qualms about it. There's a lot more work to be done. And this action plan is a big step forward for the university in order to get that work done. Now there's several good models of our action plans already in place. Earlier this year, um, we put a place that I, we put in action 
around how we were going to address some of the gender violence that has occurred on this campus. Training of our faculty, staff, and students was a piece of that, and so many other uh, components as well. And we are making good progress on making sure that we're fulfilling our, our commitments around those action items. Another good model is our work to acknowledge our relationship with the Native American and indigenous communities in light of our institutional history and land on which this campus occupies. We all know and should constantly remind ourselves that our history is painful because of the land that we're on, because of the Sand Creek Massacre and the connection to our founders. But we have also come forward to take big steps in that area as well. And I wanna thank the tireless work of many of our communities to really identify those action items by establishing the partnerships with the Cheyenne and Arapahoe communities we have made great strides in increasing the number of uh, Native American students and faculty here at the university. There's so much more to do. And a key component of that action plan is the formation of our Native American uh, Council Board that is so important to advise us as we move forward. And I look forward to fulfilling those action items as well. So it's clear that we have made some progress. Those progress has been in pockets and it's often fallen short of communicating and bringing the rest of the community along. And that's why this next phase is so important. The action items that we identified create um, five different real areas of emphasis. First of all, it creates a very sustainable and strategic diversity, equity, inclusion infrastructure here at the University of Denver. Second, it really starts to move out of these pockets and brings the rest of the campus together engaged on this really important um, initiative that we have, this imperative that we have. I think what you'll hear is the word connective tissue quite a bit um, because this is not just the work of three individuals, this is the work of all of us. And the expectation is all of us are going to make a contribution to that. And so that streamlined connected approach will be this third piece. There's no question that um, if we're really going to make progress and move forward that we have to implement an environment of accountability and consistency. So we come back to this topic regularly to inform and to reevaluate our progress along the way. And finally, it's about identifying and empowering leadership across campus. A strong central leadership for sure, and I am excited of our progress for the search for a new vice chancellor for diversity, equity, inclusion, a strong CDO model, but at the same time, a strong decentralized model as well where the expectation is that every unit, every unit will have either a committee or a, an individual who will be the point of contact for the aspirations that that unit has for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Now, before I pass the baton on to our provost, who will also be interested in saying some, some words, because I know she is deeply committed to this very topic, and before we get on with the presentation that uh, Tom Romero has for us, I wanna just talk a little bit about the rules of engagement for a healthy dialogue and a healthy conversation. I think this is a, a topic that our campus has an opportunity to improve on, to be honest with you, to have these hard conversations. And I'm so glad that we're beginning to see this be hardwired in the training that we do in the workshops for our students in particular. But what are those rules of engagement? What is it important as we enter into this really important initiative that we have? Well, first of all, I think we have to be open. We have to be transparent. Most importantly, we have to be committed to active listening 
if we're really going to be essential in our commitment and making progress in our work. And what does that mean? Well, there's a couple of, of points that I want to drive home. I think listening attentively, asking questions along the way, learning, um, and trying to deeply understand and appreciate the viewpoints of individuals. Speaking respectively. This one is essential. We must treat our colleagues with respect, even if we don't see eye to eye to them. And I'd like to I'd like to enter into these conversations with a, with a phrase that um, one of our trustees shared with me very recently, and that is to assume positive intent. Meaning as we enter into these difficult conversations, let's assume that we are lo always looking for the best interests of all of us and moving the institution forward and give them that benefit of the doubt. Third, I think thinking freely. Um, that means maybe letting go of our comfort zones and being able to be open to a variety of different new ideas. And finally, allowing that discomfort because it is only in that discomfort that we truly come to grips with our feelings and with how we are going to approach uh, the progress that we need to make. So, Creating this safe environment is part of our role. And I think this uh, dialogue, this town hall meeting is one I'm excited to have. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our provost, Mary Clark, who I know was so committed to this at her previous institution, an American University, and will bring that to the University of Denver in her new role as provost. Mary, it's great to have you with us. I'm very glad to be here. And I wanted to start with thanks. Uh, thanks to Tom and to Nikki and to Jaren for all of their leadership in developing this action plan. And we met about 10 days ago with the Provost uh, Diversity Equity Action Committee and also the Chancellor's uh, Diversity Equity uh, Action Committee. And I want to thank those members as well who provided feedback on the plan. Uh, as Jeremy highlighted, the plan was shared on Friday as a working draft, and we've already received feedback from the community, which we have already um, incorporated. So thank you for your feedback, uh, and thank you to Tom and Nikki and Jaren uh, for their leadership uh, in their ongoing thought and work uh, in developing this plan. Also wanted to thank the Faculty Senate and their leadership uh, over the summer in committing to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training uh, for the faculty. Uh, likewise, to the Office of Teaching and Learning and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in supporting the development of those uh, training modules uh, for faculty. Uh, I'd call out uh, Valentina, Leslie, and then Lisa, who I see is with us uh, for their particular leadership of that work. This work is central uh, to our mission uh, as an academic institution and as this academic institution committed to the public good. And as Jeremy had said, I uh, speak uh, to share with you my full commitment to this work. It is consonant uh, with my background as a lawyer uh, litigating civil rights matters, as a law professor uh, teaching in this area, and then as an academic administrator of the last several years where I have focused substantially on questions of uh, diversifying who our faculty are, uh, retaining uh, our diverse faculty, and creating an environment uh, of uh, belongingness uh, for all of our community members. And that is the work that I am looking forward to and committed uh, to undertaking here at DU. Very glad to be with you. Uh, and I think we turn the floor now to Tom for more of the details of the action plan. So thank you, Tom. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Provost Clark. Thank, thank you, Chancellor Hapner. Um, I also wanna thank my, my dear colleagues, um, Nikki Latino and Jaron Lowe. It's been uh, quite, quite a pleasure to, to have an opportunity to work with, with each of them uh, in these particular roles and in this particular capacity. Um, when Chancellor Hafner 
uh, gave us the charge to come up with uh, a set of action items for the, for the upcoming year. We did so informed by two really important considerations. Uh, one that Chancellor Hafner already pointed out, uh, a recognition of our extraordinary relationship uh, to the Arapaho and Cheyenne uh, and the University of Denver's uh, contribution, right, to, to the uh, violent displacement of the Arapaho and Cheyenne from the lands in which we now learn and we work uh, and we engage. And the second piece, and despite these ignoble, ignoble beginnings, we also recognize that staff, faculty, students, alumni have been pushing us for decades uh, to challenge racism, to challenge inequality, to combat discrimination, to think about alienation and, and inequity. And they've been pushing our, our campus uh, for, for decades uh, to engage in this work. For Nikki, Jaron, and I, uh, some of this work started when we recall the old Office of Multicultural Affairs being uh, a, a temporary uh, building where the soccer uh, fields now stand. And some of, some of us going uh, to, to engage with, with uh, the professionals that, that worked in that building. For others, it was to the year 2000, as Chancellor Hager mentioned, when students started the first diversity summit here at the University of Denver which has now grown to one of the largest and most important events that we do as a university. In 2006, the university committed itself to this idea of inclusive excellence. The idea, the important consideration that we cannot aspire or even call ourselves a great institution unless we dealt head on with issues of diversity, equ equity, and inclusion. Um, and much more recently in 2014 and 2015, when Chancellor Chop uh, began to structure our university in a way that could continue to amplify this work. So I want to acknowledge and recognize that that uh, Nikki, Jaron, and I stand on the shoulders and in shoulder to, uh, shoulder to shoulder with so many transformative agents that have been doing this work uh, on our campus for decades and certainly places our particular university within the larger path and the larger arc that Dr. Martin Luther King has talked about, our, our path to justice. And so what we want to share today with you um, in, in our time is, is the ways that we've been thinking about and in honor of all the work that so many of you have been doing about how we can begin to take our next steps in, in that direction. So without further ado, let's get to the presentation. All right. So as we began to, to think about this work, one of the most important things that we thought was um, that we needed to do as a university in, in the coming year was to begin to organize around what we have conceptualized as a unifying philosophy. Now, that philosophy, most importantly, has three real important elements to it. And these elements are all wrapped around the ways that we, we as a, a campus, we as a university, we as a, a community can come to have a shared understanding of terms and commitments that guide this work. So the first that we have up there is the concept and the definition of minoritized. And as I go through this presentation, I will pause and give everybody a moment to, to read some of these slides. The larger idea behind the concept of, of my, minoritize is this as a concept helps us understand the way that power and privilege work to create both institutional and, and systemic pathways, policies, patterns, and practices around inequity and inequality. So that term really helps us uh, to, to be in that shared space about what it really means to, to, to be different um, and ultimately to get to larger questions of, of inequity and inequality. A second key term and sort of idea that we want to unify around is the idea of intersectionalities. And this is a term that Kimberly Crenshaw first gave us uh, in the late 1990s and gave to us as those that are interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion work to help us understand the ways that, that being minoritized, particularly in the United States, but throughout the world, uh, has very, very, very different manifestations depending upon one's ascribed identity. 
And so we can sort of think about the differences and the way that people are minoritized based upon their gender or their language or their race. And I won't read the whole list, but we can certainly go, go down the list. But the, the larger idea here is that this works with the idea of minoritized to help us think about who our most vulnerable and our most in inequitable populations are uh, as we engage as a campus uh, with this work. And then third, we also thought it was important for us as a larger campus to engage and to define much more precisely where this work is happening, both on campus and within the nation. So the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? These are terms that many of you have seen, um, not just on campus and in our communications, but maybe on websites. And so there really are ways to sort of think about the different areas in which, in which our work to to serve and to be mindful and cognizant of our minoritized populations. The intersectionalities that exist between them happen. So we think about diversity. It's really thinking about the who. Who are the people on our campus? And again, informed by the idea of minoritized. The idea of equity. These are our policies and our practices, right? How do they contribute to um, or dismantle institutional systems of inequality? And the idea of inclusion here is really about our climate. This is the culture that we are, are, are trying to create as part of our, who we are as the University of Denver. So as we began to come together then to think about this unifying philosophy, we identified two in particular action items that we could do as a campus to help get us around the idea of a unifying philosophy. So the first, is, as, as you see up here, is to start having much more engaged conversations about what this is, what it looks like, who it's for, how we all engage within, within this type of work, and start to becoming, come together around a collective understanding about how we measure this so we can truly understand our progress in, in, in these fronts. We also know that this work is also needs to meet the current moment, right? And so this work can't be disengage from what's happening in our larger society. So our second action item up here is to really engage very deliberately with large, the larger issue of anti-racism. Um, one that we know, and as my colleague uh, uh, Nikki Latino has talked about in, in other settings, we know that we as a society are dealing with two crises, right? Two pandemics, the COVID pandemic and the humanitarian one. And this allows us as a campus to really engage with the ways that those pandemics are connected um, and, and in, intertwined within our larger diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So these are two action items around the unifying philosophy. Part of the charge that uh, Chancellor Hafner gave us uh, at the beginning of the summer as well was to begin to uh, position the university in a way that he already mentioned, one that we have a, a strong chief diversity officer, uh, one in which the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, more systematically and more intentionally engages with the entire campus and with the, the, the entire scope of diversity and, and equity and inclusion work as it happens across campus. So Chancellor Hefner has already, has already used it, right? The, the, the Vice Chancellor of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the, the larger Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion would be the larger connective tissue to doing this work in all the different academic and non-academic spaces uh, that you see up here, uh, in, which, uh, in which we need to be thinking about and engaging very directly and reporting and identifying metrics around diversity, equity, inclusion work within these five buckets, if you will. So let me, so the rest of my presentation is gonna walk us through what each of these buckets look like, each of the ways that we as uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion are gonna be the connective tissue to support this work, work in, in, in every unit, uh, both on and, and off campus. Uh, and you, you will see, we will have different action items related to some of this work uh, and, and just larger descriptions related to other parts of this work. So let's focus here now on, on kind of that, that middle bucket, the lateral support and engagement with DEI work across campus. So if we look at the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, as I mentioned, we are, are retooling our work to, to serve the campus. 
Uh, historically, as many of you know, we worked on what we call the academic side of the house, right? We worked very closely with the provost's office uh, and in collaboration uh, where appropriate with other parts of campus, with the vice chancellors, with the, with the division of student life um, and, and inclusive excellence, with human resources and inclusive communities and all other parts of campus, but we've primarily been rooted within the academic side of the house. So we're starting to move our work to be much broader in terms of the university. And the ways that we're thinking about that are within th these three sort of core areas. Uh, we first wanna connect and incubate all of this work that's happening all over campus. We wanna identify leadership that's happening in every academic division. We wanna identify leadership that's happening at the student level. We wanna identify leadership that's happening with the alumni and make sure that we are all connected around the unifying philosophy and within the, the larger, and with a larger understanding of the five buckets in which this work is happening. We also are pivoting our work to a much greater connection and support of our indigenous Latinx, uh, black as well as Asia Pacific Islander and, and related initiatives. Um, a lot of these initiatives are campus, both on and off campus. And so we want to, as an office, want to be able to help support that sort of work. We also want to, uh, we know that as part of this work, that because we were siloed, because um, we had so many different change agents doing this work across campus, we oftentimes didn't do a very good job about communi communicating and connecting our work. So we want to do a much better job. We want to be the connective tissue to communication. We want to be the connective tissue to providing a, a similar framework around transparency as well as accountability in the way that this work is happening all over campus. So that's the larger Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion as we start thinking about the larger campus engagement. We have two specific action items related to this in particular. One, we want to grow the ODI, ODI Fellow Program. Uh, this was a program that initially emerged out of DU Impact 2025 one that was focused uh, for uh, support of, of our academic units. We wanna grow this uh, to provide support, to provide training, to provide uh, sort of a, a leadership pathway for uh, every academic unit uh, by growing this fellow program. The second piece, and you're gonna see me talk about this in a couple of other different areas, is to support what we're calling a Black Excellence uh, Strategic Plan and Initiative. So really begin to um, provide very close focus um, and support to understanding the very distinct needs of our, of our Black community on campus. One that was informed uh, not just by a series of conversations that the Chancellor had uh, with, with various constituents of the Black community, but as we know, uh, as, uh, as part of decades long work for those of us that have been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work on, on campus. So these are our two action items that are connected to this, this larger bucket of, um, of, of creating, um, of, of connecting our campus, of being uh, the connective tissue. Other pieces that are central to that is to create a uh, engaged leadership structure. That has a lot of different dimensions to it. One, it starts at the top, right? Uh, it starts about, it starts with connecting the, the chancellor, it starts with connecting the provost, it starts with connecting the deans. So we have a couple of action items, we have an action item that's connected to that. Or a couple of different action items. One, we want to establish what we're calling the DEI steering committee. And this would include the chancellor and the provost. We are working now uh, to identify leadership in every uh, academic and non-academic unit uh, around DEI and th this is be the kind of core leadership, um, kind of at, at, at the larger strategic level around our DEI initiatives. We also have talked about creating subcommittees uh, around very specific work in which faculty, staff, students, alumni, um, other community partners could also engage. And so that's tied to, to the, the larger work of, of the steering com committee. We also know that um, it's been really important for um, our community to have access to our leaders. And so um, we, we want to also have an opportunity for the chancellor to engage uh, with our minoritized communities on a consistent basis 
and that for that to be mediated through a steering committee, right, or, or, or another leader, but certainly to have those opportunities for direct engagement. All right. So as we work our way back out there too, what does lateral support engagement look like for students? It, on, on a larger level, it's about us helping think through what does DEI look like as part of the 4D student, right? A specific action item tied to that is to understand this disparity that we know that exists between the graduation rates of some of our minorit minoritized students and trying to understand what that looks like and then specifically address what, what these barriers could be. So that, that's an, a specific action item in relation to the students. Other ways that we're connecting uh, across campus, we want to engage. We know that this work is about the public good. Uh, we are going to partner very, very consciously with CECL, Grand Challenges, the Carlisle Women's College, Communities Plus Values, uh, various parts of uh, DU Impact 25, such as the Knowledge Bridges, be engaged with uh, uh, sort of thinking more holistically and connectively around some things like the Diversity Summit connecting with campus safety, connecting with advancement. So, so this is a part of this work is, is we need to be the connective tissue to all of these different initiatives and all of these different spaces in which the public good is, is advanced. We know that we need to also be supporting all of our DEI change agents as we call them. These are our, all of those that are doing DEI work uh, across campus. We've already started a regular set of meetings to connect all of those that are, are dealing with diversity as a part of their diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of their job descriptions. We want to keep bringing others in. We want to make sure that we are all connected and that we are also providing support uh, to, to their work as it's happening all over campus. And finally, within the lateral support and engagement, we want to engage very, very directly with our, our DU employees uh, writ large. Uh, we want to support all, all of the different groups that we have to support our, our minoritized faculty, all the different associations and boards that we have that are, are engaging with this work. So we want to establish that protocol and be able to, to support these each of these organizations so they can uh, so they can amplify their work and be as successful as possible. So moving back out now then to our five buckets. We want to jump down into our capacity building and training. So there's a lot of ways that this is going to happen. Uh, one is through identifying these di division level pathways to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So, as I already mentioned, be, as part of our connective tissue, right, we want to grow pathways to leadership, we want to support le leadership, but we also want to create and, and share and, and collect a, um, share, a shared understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, around shared pathways, shared understanding, shared tools around strategic planning, coordination, as well as transparency and accountability. Other ways that we hope to build capacity is we know it's around recruitment, retention, and professional development it, for both our, our, our staff as well as our faculty. Um, this is requiring, of course, close connection and coordination with the Vice Chancellor of Human Resources and Inclusive Communities, the Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs, the Faculty Senate. We have a couple of specific action items in, in this regard uh, in terms of our capacity uh, to, to develop our, our community. One is we want to do something that we haven't done as a university, but some, 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 something that we know many universities do, is to develop a target of opportunity hiring initiative. So we can recruit, we can aggressively recruit uh, some of the, the, the best faculty talent out there that will diversify our, 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 our faculty. Um, we want to collaborate with the champ Chancellor's Cabinet to develop the Intercultural Development Inventory, or IDI, which provides baseline measurement 
and, and progress metrics in which we as a larger community uh, can, can understand and measure and grow around our intercultural competency. Uh, we want to start building, uh, and we already have, uh, um, Provost Clark already mentioned, uh, the Faculty Institute for Inclusive Teaching. Um, we want to do more initiatives like that uh, to help our community develop around di diversity, equity, and inclusion and get the skills. And, and one of the things that we see about particularly that, that this last point is that this is a true added value. Uh, if we can offer the, these trainings, um, if we can build these into our expectations of what we as, as professionals at the University of Denver get, this, would, this is something that you can add to your resume or your CV. It'll be a skill that others won't have. And it's certainly, certainly important in terms of, of, of the work that we do. All right. So going back out to our larger areas, uh, the, the inclusive pedagogical practices, um, the, the big piece there here is that we do have an opportunity as the University of Denver to be known. And we're, already, we're already there, but we already have the ability to sort of amplify where we are already as a nationwide leader in inclusive pedagogy and teaching practices. So we have a specific action item to grow that, to expand that, to increase the capacity of our, our Office of Teaching and Learning in particular to meet the needs of our campus and, and the external larger community. All right, so that's around capacity building and training. Three more buckets here, uh, probably about five or six more minutes, and then we can get into some questions and answers. So we know that there's a really important piece around curriculum and, and research. Um, and some of this has to do with our support of either existing or, or emerging centers of scholarly thought, of knowledge production, of knowledge transmission. Some of them that you're, you're already familiar with, others we need to grow, and there's opportunity to grow, the, to grow these, particularly as we as a community think about the different ways that we can engage with uh, minoritized communities, and also thinking through some of the, the, the different intersectionalities that, that exist. So we wanna be able to support that and, and connect that very, very deliberately to our DEI work. There's also a second piece here tied around curriculum. Uh, much stronger and robust engagement with the critical race and ethnic studies, uh, minor, growing that curriculum, hopefully in, in the future to a major, offering opportunities through certificate programs to, off, to possibly have uh, the graduate certificates in particular to possibly provide a, a major, and also to be engaged uh, more generally with how these issues appear in, in our general education, um, both at the, the undergraduate level as well as, as the graduate level. And specific action items here. First one you've seen already, support a black excellent strategic plan. More, more precisely, you know, could we grow a black studies and cultural center uh, as, as uh, a way to advance this work? Uh, and of course, the target of opportunity hiring initiative. All right. Last two buckets, uh, we know that, that the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion is really about being responsive. Um, and there's two ways you can think about being responsive. One is being reactive, right? Uh, responding to crisis. And another way to think about it is being proactive, right? Sort of anticipating when we know that there are gonna be a, a lot of challenging incidents a lot of challenging conversations uh, around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when you see that bucket of incident management, that's what we're talking about there. This sort of happens, I think, in four different spaces. Um, it revolves us, again, being the connective tissue to a variety of different places in which diversity, equity, and inclusion is happening uh, as a matter of law, as a matter of policy, as a matter of our just larger co commitments uh, as a community. Most recently in terms of, of engaging with uh, the COVID-19 rapid response team um, and, and making sure that there's a DEI lens there as part of our work. Our 
ability to be proactive as well as reactive um, is also in, re in relation to something I opened up with. The, the ways that our students, our faculty, our alumni are pushing us uh, to, to do better, to be better, right? Um, and so uh, we have a specific action item with this is to conduct a comp comprehensive review of all of our work in relation and in dialogue with all of the, the demands that our, our students, faculty, and alumni have made to provide regular updates, to, I, to talk about how we're responding um, deliberately and intentionally to all of these issues. Within the idea of consultation here is that uh, we are connecting all over campus to be thinking about where and in what ways equity issues might come up, whether it's a matter of compensation, whether it's a matter of policy, whether it's a matter of practice. So th these are some of the ways that we're, we're pivoting, uh, in particular the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, uh, to be thinking about this work and, and to be available for consultation. And then larger DU community and current events. Um, already talked about the importance of anti-racism, right? We as a campus need to be engaged within that work. We also know as well uh, and are anticipating uh, the challenges we're going to have around political discourse and efforts that are already underway um, all over campus to make sure that we're thinking about how and in what ways we as a community have the right tools, the right skills uh, to deal with what we know is going to be a challenging uh, political season and to be responsive, uh, not just now, but into the future. Finally, the last bucket here is around um, our, the ways that we work with communication, advancement, and the larger community in our larger DEI initiatives. We know and we recommend that there needs to be a much stronger engagement with marketing and communication, something that's already started. Um, just as a, as a heads up to the community, we have start, we're in the process of revamping and relaunching what, what we're calling our DEI portal. Uh, the ways that you can go into our website and begin to understand not just our unifying philosophy, but these, these core five areas of our work, where it's happening, how it's being supported, the ways that we're reporting. So we're already starting to work very closely with marketing communications around revamping the website. We know as well that there are many, many opportunities to invest in this work. Um, whether it's a matter of investing in scholarships, whether it's a matter of investing in our institutes, whether it's something that, that needs to be built, um, we are, are working and, and are recommending a much stronger coordination with uh, our advancement, as well as their larger work with alumni uh, as well. Community engagement, we know that those that have been doing this work have often been doing it with a very public facing focus. And we have tremendous resources here at the University of Denver to do that work, to do it well, to do it um, also in ways that are respectful, respective and um, responsive to our community partners. So Cecil, IRISE, uh, the Native American Community Advisory Board, the Latinx Center, the larger DU leadership team. There are all, multiple ways that we can and we should engage with the community. And then finally, and this goes to, to something that I, I've alluded to throughout this presentation. We have so many important diversity, equity, and, and inclusion leaders on this campus. We need to promote that work. We need to be engaged with this work, not just on our campus, but in higher education more generally. We need to provide opportunities and pathways for all those that do this work to engage nationally because there is so much that our larger higher education can learn from the engagement of, of these professionals. At the same time, we wanna provide pathways as well for others to, to also learn from uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals in uh, other parts of, uh, of the country. So this is another, this is the kind of the final piece of, of our work. All right. Um, so I, I know that you've, you have the action items. Hopefully you have those pulled up. 
we've listed them here um, as a kind of final set. And we'll just go these through these really, we'll just give you an opportunity one more time to kind of see these holistically. I uh, don't want to spend any more than, than a minute uh, on these next three slides, but certainly encourage you to, to pull up the link. Um, as we begin to uh, pivot now in, in our remaining time and turn in our remaining time to, to questions or feedback that, that all of you have, I um, want to let you know that uh, ask questions uh, in, the, in the question and answer. Um, anything that we can respond to either uh, by typing or uh, in real time, you will see those questions. Just know that those questions that you don't see or we don't respond to, every, every reasonable question that we get, uh, we are gonna, we're gonna provide a response to the, the, the new and emerging DEI portal. And so we will have answers to those questions up there in the coming days. And then finally, uh, as we're, we're turning now to um, not just our questions, there'll also be an opportunity and we encourage all of you, um, it's, it's also in the chat, uh, there's a survey that we would we definitely need your input. Um, that survey you can find here. You also can come back if, if you don't you don't copy it today to the to the DEI portal, um, and you can link to that survey there. So thank you, uh, thank you all for for the time. We have such a great we have a, a amazingly sort of I know engaged group. Um, it's a great turnout. And so certainly encourage now uh, your, your questions and thoughts. Tom, Jaron, Nikki, I wanna express my gratitude as well. A lot of work went into this. A lot of conversations went with a variety of groups that you did to get us to this stage in the town hall. And I just wanna reiterate that this is the beginning of a, of a broader dialogue. This is, this is not a, a, a static document. We in fully anticipate that it's dynamic and want to accommodate the great comments and input that uh, you're sharing with us today. So there will be more engagements. Um, Tom, Nikki, and Jaron will um, probably uh, talk about those and, and think about those over the course of the next several weeks. But we do anticipate that um, we have this period of time by which more input and more dialogue occurs. I'm going to moderate a few quick questions here. Um, I, time is short, but we will get to a number of interesting ones that you are all asking. Thank you all for great questions. There were a number of questions um, posed about the funding, uh, how we're going to make these action items really come to life and really make sure that we execute them with excellence on that. Um, there's comments that says the ODEI office is underfunded, understaffed, and I think we all agree with this. This has been um, a, a function of a variety of different factors, one of which was the resources. So uh, Tom and I have been in deep conversations on this. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is one of the five strategic imperatives that we have put forward. And those imperatives were deliberately identified so that we could make sure that the strategic planning funds that we have set aside and grown over the years could be allocated for um, real action to move this university forward. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion is uh, a key piece of those imperatives. And so Tom and I are um, in conversations. I expect that we would allocate for this year half a million dollars in order to move forward these aspirations. Um, I've asked Tom to develop a budget on how that, that funds would be used um, according to these action items. And I've also asked him to help make sure that we have evaluations and assessments so that we can be assured that um, these funds and these programs that we put in place are actually having the impact that we have because ultimately we will have to find permanent dollars in order to continue and sustain these efforts on long-term. And that's, of course, our aspirations. Um, there's questions about how um, funding for students and faculty and staff. Um, I think that will all occur in the budget that um, we'll be working on in the next couple of weeks. But 
there is a deep commitment from the university of making sure that there are resources available to um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts on this. There's several questions on training, the mandatory training. And I'm gonna turn to the, the panel here, Tom, Jaron, and Nikki, um, to, to dive into this. Many of them are asking, you know, how are we making this work? Um, is this really a, a reality for the university that we're expecting mandatory training for faculty as well as the staff and students? Um, how, will, how will faculty learn um, how to avoid microaggressions in the classrooms? So that broad uh, topic of mandatory training, um, why don't the panelists try to address that? I'll start and I'll start with students and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you today. So thank you and thank you to Tom and Jaron, Chancellor Hafner and Provost Clark. This year, we were able to um, initiate and launch the EverFi mandatory training for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it covers information about bias. It covers information about identity, uh, power, privilege, allyship. And it is for all incoming first year and transfer students to take before the start of the school year as part of their orientation experience. Our resident assistants are also taking it, as well as our discoveries leader, leaders. That is a starting point and a launch where we hope to open that up to all students at the graduate and undergraduate level. We'll also be working with our academic and campus partners to create a co-curricular experience around cultural competency connected to the 4D dimensional experience and the character exploration, because that's a critical part of character. So that's what we're doing um, as we launch this for students. Yes, and for, for faculty and staff, um, the mandatory training um, that we're rolling out is um, through the Ever Five modules, the preventing harassment and discrimination and managing bias. Um, and then as Nikki um, explained, the diversity, equity and inclusion for students. And so we're starting this out with uh, every new employee uh, and employee orientation going through the modules and then a, um, a goal of compliance of all faculty and staff uh, uh, doing the uh, training through uh, our LMS um, uh, system. Okay. And, and I'll very quickly just note on the faculty side, this is where uh, Provost Clark in particular talked about the, the very close relationship and, and working partnership with the Faculty Senate. Uh, the Faculty Senate uh, took a vote um, to, uh, around uh, the, the Faculty Institute for, for Inclusive Teaching, or FIP, about the importance of uh, every single faculty member at the University of Denver engaging with these models. Um, and that those modules are not just a one, one time, take it and, and now you're, you're trained, but offering opportunities to continue to develop, to grow deeper, and to embed in, in inclusive teaching practices in everything that every single faculty member does um, in terms of their course preparation, in terms of their syllabus, in terms of the way that they handle with, with tough conversations that happen in the classroom. Thank you. There's a number of questions on um, the various different affinity groups um, that aren't directly connected to race. Uh, women, for example, there's one question, I'm very interested in how the university will begin to recognize the issues of women across the campus as, as they relate to women directly as part of intersectionality. Um, there are other questions of, um, I'm trans and where do I fit into the action item? I'm going to pull in Provost Clark as well into this question, but I think this is really deserves our attention and conversation on how do we broadly address all of the needs of our minoritized populations. Great, and I was pleased with Tom's reference earlier to Kimberly Crenshaw's work, which is work that I had drawn heavily on as a lawyer and law professor in terms of intersectionalities. So I think intersectionalities is a key to our understanding of our DEI work here on campus. I think there is um, important room uh, to grow in our awareness of the particular experience of women and women of color on campus. I'm mindful 
that a number of women in science, technology, engineering, and math are contemplating uh, submitting an NSF advance grant uh, to promote those issues of women and women of color in science in particular at both the faculty and the student level. And I guess the last thing I'll say for now is Tom and I have been in conversation and likewise uh, with the deans about our curriculum and how we might uh, integrate uh, understandings of DEI uh, work values principles uh, into what uh, we're engaging our students uh, in in the classroom. Uh, so I think it is a broad understanding uh, of DEI. I think it's one informed by intersectionality and then intentional um, attention to these different uh, groups, experiences and concerns on campus. Any other comments from our panelists? Uh, let me just quickly add to, I think um, one of the things that's gonna be critically important this year as, as we're shifting, particularly we being the collective we in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, um, we know that, you know, informed by the idea of intersectionality, that there's different places on campus uh, that are, in, in which issues of, you know, whether you're trans, right, um, or whether, you're a woman, um, there is really a, sort of an important amount of expertise, right, um, around what that means. Uh, ability um, is, is another area. Um, and so um, one of the things that, that I would say is that's, that's a very important part of not just our work is to be that connective tissue, but also as we begin embedding within our larger definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that those perspectives are, are you know, the, our ability to identify what the specific challenges are, those are all gonna be part of our, our really important process here um, as we are moving in, in these directions. We are almost at the end of our hour. So we, you know, obviously weren't able to cover a lot of questions, but as you heard Tom talk about the commitment to answer all of these questions in the web portal, um, I think there is, uh, you know, we, we've got two lawyers on the panelists here. And the last question I see in the q and I think is, we have three, so I'm sorry, we do have three. I, I, uh, my goodness, my goodness. Um, I think the last uh, Q&A is worth, is an interesting one. Um, and so I'm going to take us a little over time and, and ask that one. Um, it says, it seems that a lot of folks don't understand the ways in which the Supreme Court decisions constrain using minoritized status as a criterion for hiring and advancement. It might be that odious to these constraints may be, um, as these constraints may be, we'd have more effective conversations if people understood more fully what is really possible. Should we have concerted efforts to inform people of the current landscape of, informative, of affirmative action law? One thing that I would say here is that I think a focus on process uh, is highly significant, whether we're talking about uh, faculty appointments, whether we're talking about faculty retention, um, whether we're talking about the curriculum. I think the process and having a, a very mindful process that involves individuals who have uh, engaged with um, professional development work about recognizing biases, potential biases. I think that is our most promising uh, way uh, towards um, creating the DU community that we wish to create. Uh, I was sharing uh, with the chancellor just recently uh, in the work that I've done around faculty recruitment and retention, it has been a focus on process, uh, active recruitment, using data as to where uh, diverse PhDs are graduating and recruiting from those institutions and those uh, departments uh, proactively. That is uh, the best way to attract the greatest talent to our community. Uh, and to uh, diversify our faculty. So I would highlight a process uh, and being uh, exceptionally thoughtful about uh, what um, uh, 
uh, understandings we're coming to when we do this work, that we are being conscious of uh, implicit or unconscious biases uh, as we engage in faculty search work, for example. So that's what I would uh, want to be sure to highlight. Well, thank you. We are at the end of our hour, and I want to express gratitude um, for our panelists, Tom, Nikki, and Jaron, and of course, Mary for being a part of this as well, but especially the attendees who have um, been engaged throughout the last hour and asking absolutely terrific questions. There are many of them. And again, our commitment to answering those in the web portal and in further conversations that we will have so please look forward to announcements and messages that will talk about that engagement. Um, the action plan is something I'm deeply committed to and deeply excited about that um, we're going to move forward in a meaningful way that will change our environment. It's clear that we can't do everything in the next year. Um, and so while we focus on these, it's always with a lens that there's much more to do. I think um, also this is a difficult conversation and these are, these are challenging issues that we face and focusing on the ones that really will have an impact, that's why they're in the action plan is really how I'm looking at advancing this university and this initiative. Your input into this is absolutely critical. I'm so pleased that um, we were able to come together um, during this time in the town hall and I thank everyone for joining us today for a really great conversation that we have. And I look forward to many, many more. As just noted there, this is recorded, so it will be available for those that were unable to attend. I thank you all for participating. I thank you all for being a part of this. And I hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>